Hi. Wow, I feel so tall. It's amazing. Okay, so I'm Mariam Ghani, um, and I've been to so many Creative Time summits, but somehow I never really pictured myself on the stage. So this is really exciting for me. Um, I've been so impressed by everyone working completely without notes, but I actually am going to use some. I will try not to look at them too often. Okay, so when I was asked to speak in the nationalism section, um, I tried to find a kind of central question for myself. And the question I came up with was, what role can artists play in reimagining nationalism or imagining an alternative to nationalism in a time when that term takes on increasingly toxic shades? So for the last decade or so, I've been working collaboratively with Chitra Ganesh as Index of the Disappeared, and also with Gulf Labor on activist projects, uh, thinking about how patterns of migration, rendition, detention, and deportation change the politics within and between nation states. But I'm actually not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about what we left unfinished, um, which is my research into the archives of Afghanistan's national imaginaries and the ways in which the shifting self-definitions of the Afghan state have always been reflected, anticipated, and even sometimes defined by its artists. So a key moment in this history is the Salon of Girbad, or Salon of the Whirlwind, which were these literary meetings in Kandahar in the mid-century, the mid-20th century. Um, and they actually birthed a political movement called Weh Zamyan, uh, the awakened youth. So this is an amazing moment where art actually becomes politics and a space that was created by and for culture actually allows the imagining of a completely new politics for Afghanistan. So the movement Weh Zanmyan actually didn't last very long. It was dissolved in the 1952 crackdown on political parties, but it's still very influential today. There's actually a new party also called Awakened Youth um, that's active right now. And it also was very critical to the radicalization um, this is a new Salani Gidbad I recently did, but uh, it was critical to the radicalization of the Afghan left. And this is a thing I want to emphasize to all of you, there was an Afghan left, um, and there still is an Afghan left. Um, this is something lots of people don't know. Um, so there was a progressive movement, it started in the 50s, it got really active in the 60s, there's lots and lots of protests going on, strikes, student strikes, worker strikes, teacher strikes, solidarity strikes. Um, and then this gradually became, this progressive movement gradually became a communist party. And that communist party staged a coup d'etat in 1978. That was an Afghan communist coup d'etat before the Soviet invasion. And then that party actually splintered into several parts. That happened before the coup d'etat, and then they came back together, and then they splintered apart again under the pressures of actually coming into power. So the Girdbad, or, or the whirlwind, is also a kind of apt description for the moment in a radical movement when you actually seize power. Uh, and then everything you've imagined for so long seems actually possible to realize just for that brief moment until events kind of acquire their own momentum and uh, everything starts to spin dizzily out of control and minor mistakes become major disasters. So one thing that I've been interested in in this research is the question of, you know, can we locate that moment, the moment before the dream disintegrated? Can we somehow recuperate its potential? Can we actually recross the shadow that fell between the intention and the act? So if the original intentions, the raw desires and fears of the Afghan communists can be found anywhere, it's in their unfinished projects. And I mean both the unfinished artistic projects and the unfinished pol political projects. Uh, the political projects, which were sometimes quite contradictory, were revolution, reform, and reconciliation, which is especially important to Afghanistan these days. And the unfinished artistic projects are especially strongly encoded in unfinished films, state-produced and state-canceled films, which can be understood kind of as failed propaganda. Um, so for the last two years, I've been trying to find these, these five unfinished feature films produced during the communist period, that's 78 to 91. And these fragmented fictions reflect the shifting moods and everyday realities of life under the regime in different moments. So, you know, you start with this kind of like triumphalist 
in the month of Sar. Sar roughly corresponds to April in the Islamic solar calendar. Um, and this is a reenactment of the 78 coup d'etat with the participation of the actual army and party leaders uh, doing what they did on the day of the coup. Uh, and this is a, a fiction which actually ends up becoming the default document of the coup d'etat because there's no document of the coup d'etat itself. But as we pass from this moment, 78, to through the splintering of the party and into the Soviet invasion and the installation of the Parchem puppet regime, we then have the paranoid surveillance uh, story of Sokut or falling. Um, this is silent because it's, it's reconstructed from partial rush prints. Um, and this really is basically an encoding of anxieties about the, the massive uh, intelligence apparatus. There were 20,000 people working for the intelligence service at the time that this was made. Um, and it's encoded in a cops and robbers story where everybody's spying on each other. But when you get to 1990, when Kajra, or Wrong Way, was made, it's actually a story that's all about reconciliation with the Mujahideen. So here you have a fictional reconciliation between a family split by war that's happening about a year before the actual reconciliation started taking place, so anticipating uh, the national reconciliation that was happening at this time. I really loved how he, he throws, throws the rifle. That's one of my favorite things in this film. It's kind of amazing. Okay. Um, so I've also been trying to find all the people who made these films, and this is the guy who directed the clip you just saw, uh, Juan Sher Haidari. And I've been trying to use the films to actually start conversations um, with the original filmmakers who are all still alive but don't have access to their negatives. Um, a lot of the negatives are actually kind of lost. I think they're in Uzbekistan, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and uh, also with uh, the larger community around filmmaking in Afghanistan, um, with leftist exiles outside Afghanistan, trying to stage a lot of like sort of tiny reconciliations. Um, and with artists, musicians, writers, and filmmakers who have actually never before encountered Afghan films, but who, who see in these unfinished projects a kind of opening into which they can enter to imagine temporary endings, improvised endings, um, together, uh, rather than just sort of spectating separately. So the process of this project, which involves reconstructing a narrative from partial rush prints, guessing at lost dialogue, gathering together images and people who have been scattered by war, basically mirrors the larger process through which the history of this period is gradually and very gingerly being recovered. Um, there's also this really fascinating gap between the stories that were produced for the screen during this time and the stories of how the films were actually made, which involved incredible difficulties, dangers, and sometimes even death. That's because they were using live ammunition in all of the gun scenes, in all the gun battles. So actually someone did occasionally get killed when you use live ammunition to stage a gun battle. Um, but you know, that gap actually also reproduces in miniature a larger gap, which is the gap between what was wished and what was done, between the national imaginary and the lived reality at the time. So, I don't know, maybe the filmmakers were trying to sort of will this better world that they scripted into existence, like Firdosi, you know, coaching his patron with this book of really, really great kings. Um, that's an Afghan joke. Somebody will get it, maybe on the live stream. Um, <laughs> perhaps there comes a point in every revolution where it only exists in its representations, but does that mean it no longer exists? Or has it just gone into storage, waiting in the archive until its revival is required? So I've always thought of the story of Shahriyar and Shahrazada as a metaphor for the relationship between the artist and the nation. Uh, you know the story, or at least the outline of it. A king goes mad after seeing something he cannot bear. And in his madness, he nearly destroys the kingdom of which he is both ruler and symbol. Every night he marries a wife, and it's always a girl who's plucked from the lower classes, who has no power to resist. And every morning he orders her execution, so the rule of law has dissolved and the reign of terror has taken its place. 
And then Shahrazada, who's actually a minister's daughter, gives up her privilege. She volunteers for the marriage, but she staves off her death by telling stories all night, always leaving some of the tale untold at dawn so that she lives another day to complete complete it. But every story contains another story and another and so on. Stories about people telling stories to save their lives, to gain justice, and to reach judgment. Stories about wise caliphs and great kings um, who spare the innocent and punish only the guilty. And by the time a thousand and one nights have passed, the sanity of Shahriyar has been restored and the nightmare of his kingdom has passed. So, you know, we can't all be Shahrazada, saving our nation single-handed. But we can be many Shahrazadas, telling our stories night after night and dragging the world back to sanity, one listener at a time. You know, when what was uh, in exciting about your presentation is that you sort of broke apart the, the general stereotypes mm -hmm. we have about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think of Afghanistan, people think of uh, Taliban first, mm -hmm. yes. then NATO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then Osama bin Laden, uh -huh. then George Bush, U.S. government. Yeah, you're really going through almost all the stereotypes e for us now. Everything, <laughs> everything. They almost <laughs> never think of Afghans. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then maybe if they think of an Afghan, it's Mullah Omar, mm -hmm. um, and so on. So this is the, the list. And the, what you have brought here is that you know, nobody thinks of socialism or mm -hmm. left or mm -hmm. women's rights or mm -hmm. and not women's rights from outside, but mm -hmm. women, Afghan women's concerns yes. and so on. So yeah. you brought a sort of... Um, part that really was very much a part of Af including the Communist Party, whatever, mm -hmm. however bad it might have been in <laughs> Afghanistan, that nobody thinks of communist parties either. When they made a lot of mistakes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the question mm -hmm. I put to you is, um, how do you, in telling the story, um, how do you uh, um, think about how the audience and others respond to mm -hmm. your telling a different story about Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, and maybe it's eclipsed, it's small, it's part of it, mm -hmm. but, but very much a part of Afghanistan. That's mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in kind of challenging these stereotypes, I suppose, or not specifically challenging stereotypes, but in telling a fuller history of Afghanistan and recuperating some parts of this historical narrative that have been omitted even from histories that are told inside Afghanistan, because as I said, it's, it's a history that's only gradually being recovered also in Afghanistan. Um, the, the leftists were actually left out of the bond process. Mm -hmm. um, everyone had a seat at the table of the bond process which constructed the transitional administration except the leftists. And I think that's one reason why this history has not been part of, of the telling of the Afghan narrative um, after uh, 2001 is because the leftists have not been part of the politics, of the, of the active politics yeah. of Afghanistan, but they actually are now starting to revive both wings of the party, have new chapters in Afghanistan. This is something I just found out recently. Um, and some of the old institutions, like the, uh, the Women's Progressive Union, uh, which was started in the 60s, are also like, starting to be active again. Um, yeah. So those are, those are definitely things that I'm interested in kind of bringing, bringing back into public view, um, not only for the benefit of people outside Afghanistan, but also for people inside Afghanistan in a way to, to make it, there's certain things that haven't necessarily been permissible to talk about, um, and, and somebody has to start that conversation. Um, and art is a safe space to start difficult conversations. Excellent, yep. thank you very much. Thanks.